This is the China Brief. Today is February 23, 2023. Russia, China show off ties amid maneuvering over Ukraine. According to Associate Press, China's most senior foreign policy official, Wang Yi, visited Moscow to discuss deepening ties between Russia and China. The visit comes as the conflict in Ukraine continues to upend the global diplomatic order, and relations between Russia and the West are at their lowest point since the Cold War. Russian President Vladimir Putin hailed the ties between the two countries and expressed his expectation of Chinese President Xi Jinping visiting Russia. Russia has staunchly supported China amid tensions with the U.S. over Taiwan, while China has refused to criticize the invasion of Ukraine and echoed Moscow's claim that the U.S. and NATO were to blame for provoking the Kremlin. The rapprochement between China and Russia has worried the West, with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken calling any Chinese involvement in the Kremlin's war effort a serious problem. The two countries have held military drills showcasing their defense ties, and are holding naval drills with South Africa in the Indian Ocean this week. The potential of Chinese assistance to Russia in the conflict would amount to providing direct support to a violation of international law. While China has emphasized its close ties with Russia, it must tread carefully to avoid an escalation of tensions with the West as it looks to stimulate its economy following the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Putin's announcement on Tuesday that Russia would suspend its participation in the New START treaty raised new concerns about the fate of arms control agreements. The growing relationship between China and Russia is another example of how the war could spread into perilous new terrain. This is the China Brief. Today is February 23, 2023. U.S. concerned by China-Russia ties as Putin signals she visit. According to Reuters, U.S. expresses concerns over China-Russia alignment amid reports of China potentially providing weapons for Russia's war in Ukraine, which could escalate the conflict. Russian President Vladimir Putin welcomes China's top diplomat Wang Yi to the Kremlin, signaling that Chinese President Xi Jinping will visit his country. Putin tells Wang bilateral trade between the two countries was better than expected and could reach $200 billion a year, and the two nations were reaching new frontiers. U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price says the visit is further evidence of Beijing's alignment with Moscow and the two countries share a vision of might making right and borders being redrawn by force. Wang says China would play a constructive role in the political settlement of the Ukraine crisis and adhere to an objective and impartial position. Russia values China's balanced approach to the crisis, but the two nations did not discuss a reported Chinese peace plan. The U.S. has not yet seen the PRC provide Russia with lethal aid, but it believes China has not taken it off the table. The relationship between China and Russia is not directed against any third party but equally would not succumb to pressure from third parties, says Wang. Russia is now more dependent on Beijing than ever and is a junior partner to a resurgent China. She has stood by Putin during the Ukraine conflict, and China is Russia's largest buyer of oil, a key source of revenues for Moscow's state coffers. This is the China Brief. Today is February 23, 2023. China's tech rainmaker vanishes, and so does business confidence. According to the New York Times, Bao Fan, founder of China Renaissance, a Chinese investment bank, who brokered deals for some of China's most successful tech companies and has worked with nearly every mover and shaker in the industry, went missing on Valentine's Day 2022. His company confirmed his disappearance in a regulatory filing, and Chinese media reported that the authorities summoned him to assist in an investigation of a former senior executive of his company who used to work at a state-owned financial institution. Bao's disappearance has undercut Beijing's new priority to restore business confidence and threatens to upend the government's promise that it supports private enterprise and provides legal protections for the business class. The episode also illustrates how China's tech industry has become entangled with the government, and this worries entrepreneurs and investors that the authorities can make anybody disappear without legal processes. 
Mr. Bao is one of many Chinese born in the 1960s and 1970s who benefited from policies that opened up the country. He got his bachelor's and master's degrees in Norway and worked for Morgan Stanley and Credit Suisse after graduation. He founded China Renaissance in 2004 and became a go-to banker for China's hot startups in the budding internet industry. China Renaissance's best years were between 2015 and 2017, and Mr. Bao helped put together mega-mergers in 2015 that produced dominant internet companies such as Didi and Meituan. As tech grew, so did Mr. Bao's ambition. In addition to dominating deals, his firm started investing in startups. He became as famous as the founders he had helped shepherd and was a sought-after speaker at conferences. Like many people in China's tech industry, Mr. Bao believed in the free market and wanted minimal government intervention. But the Chinese government intensified its control over the economy, and the tech industry had to learn to deal with it by expanding their government relations teams. In 2017, ICBC International, a division of the state-owned banking giant ICBC, provided the investment bank with a $200 million credit line, backed by shares in his firm, which China Renaissance repaid after going public in Hong Kong in 2018. In 2020, Mr. Bao hired Song Lin, the head of ICBC International, as chairman of a brokerage business China Renaissance had formed. Last September, Mr. Bao raised $398 million to take China Renaissance private again. Bao's disappearance worries China's tech industry as a whole, with entrepreneurs and investors concerned about its impact on the sector and whether it signals further government intervention in the industry. This is the China Brief. Today is February 23, 2023. China's LEO push looms over Western expansion efforts. According to Space News, China is planning to deploy a global broadband network in low Earth orbit, LEO, in the next 5 to 10 years. This will have significant impact on Western constellation operators looking to maximize their international subscriber numbers. Chinese LEO constellation will be able to provide strong competition to Western operators, particularly in countries with deep political ties to China. Countries like Belarus, Pakistan, Venezuela, Bolivia, Laos, Indonesia, Malaysia, Brazil, Argentina, and most large African countries, that have bought GEO satellites from China in the past, may be more inclined to award landing rights to a Chinese constellation over Western alternatives. The Chinese government's firm grip on information channels means foreign satellite broadband providers are currently locked out of China. Most non-Chinese satellite operators get less than 1% of global revenues from China. In Marsat, Ticom, APT Satellite, and AsiaSat are some of the few foreign satellite companies that have done business in China. Analysts expect China to focus more on having its own domestic capabilities for satellite communications. India is set to become the world's most populous country this year and is making strides to open up its space industry to foreign companies to capitalize on subscriber potential. India is working to finalize a new space policy that would offer a level playing field to private players. Western satellite operators, such as Starlink and OneWeb, are looking to meet the demand for more broadband in India as it eases protectionist measures. This is the China Brief. Today is February 23, 2023. Proposal of Disengagement Discussed in India-China Border Talks According to Business Standard, the Working Mechanism for Consultation and Coordination on India-China Border Affairs, WMCC, held a meeting in Beijing to discuss the proposal of disengagement in the remaining border areas. This was the 26th meeting of the WMCC and the first one held in person since the 14th meeting in July 2019. The Indian delegation was led by the Joint Secretary, East Asia, in the Ministry of External Affairs, while the Chinese delegation was led by the Director General of Boundary and Oceanic Affairs Department of the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Both sides reviewed the situation along the line of actual control, LAC, 
in the western sector of India-China border areas and discussed proposals for disengagement in the remaining areas in an open and constructive manner. The objective is to restore peace and tranquility along the LAC and create conditions for the restoration of normalcy in bilateral relations. The MEA said that to achieve this objective, both sides agreed to hold the next, 18th, round of the senior commanders meeting at an early date in accordance with existing bilateral agreements and protocols. The two sides also agreed to continue discussions through military and diplomatic channels. This is the China Brief. Today is February 23, 2023. Canada must be on guard against Chinese election interference, Trudeau says. According to Reuters, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau warned of the danger of foreign interference in elections and said the country should be on guard against it, following reports that China tried to influence Canada's last election. The Globe and Mail newspaper reported that Chinese diplomats and their proxies worked to defeat conservative politicians considered more hostile to Beijing, and that China favored a Trudeau re-election. Trudeau called the report an extraordinarily serious issue and said it was a systematic attempt at interference by countries such as China and Russia, who he said want to destabilize democracies. Canada has already raised serious concerns directly with Chinese President Xi Jinping over Beijing's suspected meddling in the 2019 election. The relationship between China and Canada has been strained since the 2018 detention of Huawei's executive Meng Wanzhou and Beijing's subsequent arrest of two Canadians on spying charges. Tensions have risen recently, following the shooting down of a suspected Chinese spy balloon over North American airspace and the Globe's report about China's attempts to influence the last Canadian election. Ottawa confirmed that other air and maritime surveillance attempts by China were thwarted by the Canadian military, after Chinese floating devices were found in the Arctic in autumn. China's top diplomat Wang Yi accused the U.S. of an absurd act that had violated international norms in relation to the shooting down of the spy balloon. The Chinese embassy in Ottawa did not respond to a request for comment. This is the China Brief. Today is February 23, 2023. China urges state firms to drop big four auditors, Bloomberg reports. According to Reuters, Chinese authorities have asked state-owned companies to stop using PwC, EY, KPMG and Deloitte, the four largest global accounting firms, due to concerns about data security. The Ministry of Finance and other government entities gave informal guidance to some state-owned enterprises last month, urging them to let contracts with the global auditors expire. Offshore subsidiaries can still use the global auditors, but their parent companies have been urged to hire local Chinese or Hong Kong accountants. China implemented its data security law in September 2021, requiring Chinese companies and localities to categorize data based on its relevance to national security and the economy. The big four accounting firms received a combined revenue of 20.6 billion yuan, $2.99 billion, from all Chinese clients in 2021, according to Finance Ministry data. China has been reluctant to permit offshore authorities to access U.S.-listed Chinese companies' audit papers without its approval, citing national security concerns. The U.S. and China reached a deal last year to allow U.S. securities regulators to inspect audit documents in Hong Kong, and the U.S. accounting watchdog now has full access to inspect and investigate firms in China for the first time. Erica Williams, chair of the U.S. Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, said on Wednesday there would be no loopholes for accounting firms in China that are registered with her agency, and the board would take action if PRC authorities obstruct or fail to facilitate the PCABE's complete access to audit documents. This is the China Brief. Today is February 23, 2023. Buddhist leader Xing Yun wooed Beijing to access China. According to Nikkei Asia, Xing Yun was a prominent religious leader in Taiwan who promoted Buddhism globally and founded Fo Guangshan, one of the most influential Buddhist institutions in the Chinese-speaking world. 
Xing Yun had a desire to build a network of temples in China and promote Buddhism there after decades of anti-religion campaigns by the communist government under Mao Zedong, leading to his pro-Beijing views. He courted controversy with his pro-Beijing views and dismissal of the Taiwanese identity, as Beijing claims Taiwan as its own territory. Xing Yun transformed and exported Chinese Buddhism and established over 170 FO Guangshan chapters on five continents, attracting more than 2,000 disciples and over a million devotees around the world. Xing Yun's concept of humanistic Buddhism contributed to a shift in Chinese Buddhist practices from one that was ritual-centered and otherworldly to one that focused on the here and now through the practice of the Dharma and the promotion of Buddhist education and social welfare. While Xing Yun focused on growing his Buddhist organization, he also seemed to sympathize with what many saw as China's efforts to undermine Taiwan's sovereignty, putting him increasingly at odds with the majority view among the people of Taiwan. Xing Yun supported calls by both Beijing and the KMT for peaceful unification under One China, and was closely associated with the KMT, including serving on the party's central committee. Xing Yun's form of Buddhist devotion helped lower the temperature of Taiwan's contentious politics, stressing the need for a peaceful resolution of polarizing issues in Taiwan's domestic politics. Xing Yun's death leaves hundreds of thousands of devoted followers mourning their revered religious leader and deprives China of a powerful propaganda tool. Beijing's proposal to send a delegation to Xing Yun's funeral led to a row with Taiwan, and the Chinese delegation ultimately boycotted the funeral. This is the China Brief. Today is February 23, 2023. China travel demand fails to pick up despite reopening, AirAsia X says. According to the Edge Market, AirAsia X, Malaysia's long-haul budget airline, has only sold enough tickets from China to fill half of an aircraft seats. The sudden and rapid easing of stringent rules for travel into China has caught some embassies and consulates in China off guard and understaffed, causing delays for business visas. AirAsia X plans to fly to Guangzhou, Shanghai, and Chengdu starting this month and will add services to Beijing around April. Outbound travel from Malaysia to China has been weak due to expensive COVID testing requirements and a complicated visa process. AirAsia X is committed to taking delivery of 15 Airbus SE A330 Neos and 20 A321 XLR jets, which will be deployed to smaller cities in China and India to grow the airline's network and not merely replace older planes. In Q4 2022, AirAsia X posted a profit of MYR $153 million, $34 million, boosted by the year-end travel season. Shares of AirAsia X surged as much as 40% on February 23, and its parent company, Capital ABHD, rose as much as 10.5%. This is the China Brief. Today is February 23, 2023. Hong Kong's penthouses face China's common prosperity. According to the Washington Post, the Hong Kong government is building over 10,000 temporary public housing units on a plot of land in Kai Tak that was reserved for commercial use, causing dismay among owners of luxury apartments. The government aims to spend two years constructing the units, allow families in need to live there for five years, and then return the land for its original purpose. The light public housing scheme will offer monthly rents for units measuring 330 square feet for at most 2,650 Hong Kong dollars, $338, a significant contrast to luxury units nearby which can cost 15,000 Hong Kong dollars and up. Kai Tak residents worry that their property prices will fall, and developers might rush to sell existing stock and offer discounts and rebates. Hong Kong's builders have already started resorting to price cuts to boost their sales, and more than 10,000 units from 17 new projects could come to flood the market this year, according to Bloomberg Intelligence. The government's enthusiasm for social housing is changing the landscape of high-end residential real estate in Hong Kong, and the lack of commitment to earlier plans could cause developers to get more conservative in land bidding. The government could have chosen a less prime location for public housing and waited for better bidders for the Kai Tak parcel instead, 
but Li's enthusiasm for social housing is admirable. This is the China Brief. Thank you for watching.